The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. 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 Okay, so you'll be interested in the plug-in stuff. Yes. Um, and just to give you a little background on myself uh, with regards to FreeNAS, um, so the company I work for is leading the development in the 8 series, and I'm the person who gets to write all the documentation. So I'm the person to email if you find stuff in the documentation that's not clear. And we'll probably find stuff as we go through the day today, so I'll probably be making notes about that. So the outline for today's course, um, we'll just do a basic introduction on what FreeNAS is, what its features are, a little bit about the history so you have an idea what's going on. And we'll also do an overview of ZFS. Uh, ZFS is one of the sort of crown jewels around FreeNAS and most people aren't familiar with ZFS or what it is that you can do with it. And I can tell you that once you start using ZFS, you don't go back to anything else. It's really pretty cool. So we'll do a little uh, bit about ZFS. You'll find as we go through the day and we start looking at the features, a lot of the stuff that you can do with FreeNAS, uh, you can only do with ZFS because it's features that come with ZFS. We'll then see what luck we have doing installations. And FreeNAS, um, one of the reasons why everybody will get an ISO and the course materials is you'll probably find it easier to do at home when you have reliable um, networking. Um, I'm, we're going to see today how reliable the networking is going to be. Um, FreeNAS is meant to be installed on a USB thumb drive, and then you use your web browser to administer it. And what we'll find with VirtualBox uh, a, it doesn't work well with wireless, and B, what we may have to do is divide the room into uh, private network segments and statically assign addresses to make it easy uh, to access through a web browser. So we'll see what fun we have with that. If absolute worst comes to worst, uh, we'll look at my system, because um, I, I have been practicing this week, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, once we have everything installed, uh, we'll sort of go through the graphical interface to give you an idea where do you go to do what it is that you want to do. And then we'll start into the configuration workflow. So if I have a brand new FreeNAS system, um, where do I go from here? How do I get everything set up so that users can start storing data and accessing their data? Uh, one of the new things that's coming in 8.2, so FreeNAS is has always been designed uh, that you use a graphical interface through a web browser. And if you're an old Unix geek, you like to use the command line. And you're comfortable using command line tools. Well, uh, one of the new features in 8.2, which is absolutely my favorite feature, is there's a built-in web shell. And you can go in and just interact with your FreeNAS system uh, from the command line. We'll also talk about useful command line utilities, and this is the part where we'll probably add to the course notes. I'm so used to knowing what to do on a FreeBSD system, I can't even think of what's useful for someone who's thinking, how do I do this? So we'll probably start adding uh, commands um, for people that want to know what is it, what command do I use to accomplish this. And then towards the end of the day, we'll get into the plugin architecture, a little bit about the design, how it works, and then we'll install some plugins and you'll get to see how cool it is uh, to actually interact with them. 
So that's uh, basically the lineup for the day. Um, once we get to the hands-on part, I won't have this up anymore, um, but the uh, PDF um, for today's course is on that thumb drive, uh, so feel free to follow along uh, using that. Okay. So we have a whole bunch of table of contents. Uh, some of the stuff uh, that you should be able to get out of this course by the end of the day, you should be very comfortable performing an installation. And you'll see that it's not rocket science. It's actually pretty uh, trivial. Uh, we'll cover how to do an upgrade so that you'll know how to do that as new versions become available. Um, hopefully, you'll be fairly comfortable with ZFS by the end of the day, so you'll know how to create volumes, uh, when to use uh, data sets and ZVols, and how to create those and set them up. Uh, you'll be able to uh, create user accounts, as well as we'll do an overview of how to import existing account information from either an Active Directory domain or an Open LDAP domain. Um, important, you'll know how to save your configuration. Um, and also manage uh, some other cool features about ZFS, so how to create snapshots, how to replicate them to another system, and uh, we'll talk a bit about ZFS scrubs, uh, why you want them and how to schedule them. We'll then install the plugins jail and install some uh, third-party software uh, plugins. And because plugins are new, it's going to take a while for people to create uh, plugin software. So in the meantime, I'll show you how to install FreeBSD packages and how to install FreeBSD or compile FreeBSD ports from within the plugins jail. So that way you still have access to software uh, before people create plugins for it. Okay. So we'll do a little bit of an introduction to FreeNAS. That's very small to see, so you may just want to follow along on yours, and I probably will ignore it altogether and just ramble on. Um, so feel free to interject questions uh, as we go along. So FreeNAS has been around since about 2004, and it was originally created as one of those uh, projects that scratched the itch of a developer. So he wanted uh, a way to make a quick and dirty storage appliance. So he took an existing uh, FreeBSD firewall called MonoWall, and he turned that into the um, FreeNAS project. So he created a PHP uh, web front end where you could go in and um, uh, configure the device. And it became very popular very quickly and people started doing all kinds of funky things with their uh, NAS appliance. So they were installing all kinds of software um, and using it. And it very quickly got a very large community. What happened over time, though, is it became obvious that Monowall was not a good um, platform to begin with. Uh, PHP has its own security risks, and all the stuff that was being added into it, we were starting to get into bloatware. And it was getting very difficult um, to keep up with things like security advisories and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, compounded on that, the original developer got married, had kids, and didn't have time to do anything anymore. So he was going to say, I can't do this anymore. What are we going to do with this? We really should be redesigning this because it's turning into a very big piece of software. So at that point, um, a couple of designs came out. So one of the developers uh, forked off into something called Open Media Vault, or OMV. Uh, this one is based on Debian, and it's a GPL licensed. And a lot of the original FreeNAS users didn't like to see it moving away from FreeBSD-based under a BSD license. Uh, at that point, IX Systems started another um, fork, and that became FreeNAS 8. And um, more recently, um, the original FreeNAS, one of the developers has forked it into something called NAS for free. So right now, there's about three forks. 
So we're doing the uh, Freenas 8 one, which is the new design, tight core, plug-in architecture to install what you want. That's what we're covering. If you go to the, the freenas.org uh, website, um, you'll see what versions are out there. So right now, if you're running Freenas in production, you want to use the stable release, and that is 8.0.4 patch 2, so P2. And if you drop by the uh, BSD booth tomorrow, we're giving away those CDs so you can get a copy of the latest production release. It's important if you're using FreeNAS that you use the latest release. It doesn't matter whether it's NAS for free, OMV, or um, FreeNAS 804. Um, some of you may have heard that there were two very severe um, SAMBA vulnerabilities in the last month. And you need, if you're using Windows shares at all, you need to be fully patched against that. There was also a, a critical open SSL vulnerability in the last month, and um, that's going to affect your access to the web GUI. So you do want to be running uh, patch two to make sure that you're fully patched. We're working today with the 8.2 series. This is the one that um, introduces the plugin architecture. Um, if you're going to test that on a testing system or in virtual box, you can use the one that we have today, which is the latest revision as of this week. And sometime next week, beta 4 should be out. And that will be the most recent one. You don't want to run it in production, though, until it becomes release. So we're not quite in release candidate status yet. You'll know that the plugin architecture is stabilized once we get out of beta and we start calling them RCs. So that means it's a release candidate, everything is frozen, we're just looking for bugs before we do release. So we sort of follow the FreeBSD schedule that way. Um, let's see, so that's the 8.2 series. Have a whole list of FreeNAS core features, so the, the NAS part itself. So typically, um, when you're looking at a storage of clients, you want to see what compatibility am I going to have the clients on my network? So what type of shares can I create? So you can create shares using uh, Apple Talk or AFP, um, SIFS or Samba for Windows. Um, we have NFS shares, which are basically supported by any type of client. You can set up both uh, unencrypted and encrypted FTP. Um, you can do uh, SFTP, SSH. Uh, TFTP, if you're storing the images for your appliances in the network. And also iSCSI, uh, if you want to um, mount raw devices in the network. When it comes to setting up permissions, uh, we support both um, NFS Unix style permissions, as well as Windows uh, ACLs. So if you're using Active Directory and you have the extended uh, permissions, it supports that. You can either create your users and groups manually, or if you already have an Active Directory server or an Open LDAP server in your network, you can import the existing information. So you don't have to recreate those users. When we get into file systems, to the client, it doesn't matter what file system is used on the storage appliance, as long as they can connect to that data and they have permissions to do what they need to do. You have a choice of either UFS, uh, which is the Unix file system used by FreeBSD, or you can use ZFS. If you're using UFS, it's version 2, which supports things like extended attributes, uh, NFS version 4. So you're getting those sort of things. Um, you can also uh, set up mirrors, stripes, RAID 3. With ZFS, you're going to get more possibilities. So we're going to talk about the ZFS type of RAID, um, which offers uh, benefits beyond traditional hardware RAID as well as UFS RAID. And you can also do things um, such as set up quotas and compression and create snapshots, so what the file system looks like at that point in time. And we'll be covering those in more detail. Um, what else do we got here? Oh, 
one of the things that's new from the traditional free NAS is you're not supposed to install on a hard drive anymore. You either install on a USB thumb drive or on a flash device. The reason for that is the operating system is meant to be separate from your storage data. And it really doesn't matter if you lose the operating system. If you lose the operating system, your storage disks have not been touched. And if you're a smart admin and have backed up your config, it doesn't matter. You just bring yourself another USB image, um, stick it in, and everything continues to perk along. So that's one of the reasons why we do a separation. So it doesn't matter if the OS dies. The other reason we do the separation is it's almost similar, uh, anybody who's used to working with, um, say, for example, routers. Um, when the thumb drive is partitioned, it's divided into four partitions. And the first half of the device is your current operating system, the one that you're running right now, so your running image. If you go and upgrade, um, that is preserved, and the other half of the device is used for the new operating system. So that means if, God forbid, something goes wrong and you can't boot into the new operating system, you just reboot and pick the old one. So that also is a feature of that. Um, the graphical interface is no longer PHP. It's all uh, Django, uh, Dojo stuff. You can do uh, cool things um, like um, manage our sync tasks. Anybody who's ever had to set up a cron job manually and you're trying to remember, oh God, where do all my asterisks go and how do I do my times? We have a nice GUI interface for that, so it's very easy to set up cron jobs. Um, and if you're using uh, smart capable devices, there's a GUI to schedule your smart tasks and it will email you if there's a problem with one of your devices. Um, uh, there's a UPS GUI, so if you're plugged into a UPS. Uh, we do have USB 3 support. Uh, it supports shadow copies, so as soon as you start creating uh, a ZFS snapshots, if you have Windows clients in your network, um, that um, backed up data appears as shadow copies and it just sort of happens like magic, which is cool. And it's also fully localized. Um, so we support, I think it's about 60 languages now, and if localization is something that you're interested in, uh, we do have a Poodle instance at poodle.freenas.org where you can go and see the status of your language. And Poodle, if you've never used it before, is basically through your web browser, you can go in and see what um, menus have been translated. And if there's a menu that's not translated, you just type in the translation. So you don't have to learn how to do .po files or any of the, the really, it's just a nice front end. You don't have to know anything technical. You just go in and do the translations. So that's some of our features. Okay, let's talk a little bit about ZFS. And this is where you definitely want to make sure you come home with a copy of uh, today's PDF, because we have a lot of good links where you can do further research on ZFS. So ZFS was originally developed by Sun, uh, which unfortunately means it's now owned by Oracle. Um, ZFS has been around for a while, and it was designed to take the benefits of a file system as well as the benefits of a logical volume manager. So it's sort of both of those mixed in together. It was designed by a company that wanted to sell you really good hardware and a lot of hardware, so it's designed to be very scalable as far as hardware is concerned. And if you're used to traditional um, Unix formatting of disks, it takes a while to wrap your head around the way ZFS does things. So you don't go in and create things such as root and USR and var and that sort of stuff. So the stuff that you're used to doing. Instead, what you do is you create things known as storage pools. So you basically tell ZFS, here's a bunch of disks, go ahead and manage them. 
and that's basically your pool where your storage goes. Once you have a pool, then you can start dividing up that storage into areas that make sense to you. So we'll be talking a bit about data sets. You can create an area, say 300 gigs big, and you can say this particular area, I want you to turn on compression. Um, I want you to do reserve quotas. You can do things like that. There's a whole bunch of attributes you can set. So you basically divide your, your complete pool into areas that you want to use. And this can be very handy on a storage device because uh, you can go in, for example, and create a data set for a user and say, you get 300 gigs, that's all you get. Your data will be compressed, and this is the permissions I'm going to set on your storage area. So you can do cool things like that. Um, the other thing, um, especially when we're dealing with storage, it's sort of a big deal when disks die. So you want to do things like redundancy uh, so that you don't lose all your data if disks die. And the traditional solution for that was usually to use hardware RAID or some sort of software RAID. And ZFS does RAID differently. So one of the things, if you read the, um, say, the Wikipedia entry on ZFS, it'll say if you have hardware RAID, put it in JBOT mode. So basically turn off your hardware RAID because ZFS performs better if it has um, complete access to your raw disks. ZFS, when it was designed, was specifically designed to um, overcome one of the problems with hardware RAID, and that problem is called the right hole. So in hardware RAID, um, if, you're, um, if you lose a disk between um, the parity read and write, you can actually lose um, data. And that's one of the things that's sort of inherent in hardware RAID. How ZFS does its thing, it doesn't have that problem. When you're using ZFS, it's sort of a big deal what version of ZFS that you're using. And this is something um, that will um, typically decide um, what am I going to use uh, to get the, the ZFS version that I need. So I have a chart there um, if we're looking at it from the FreeBSD FreeNAS perspective. So FreeBSD ported over ZFS about six years ago. Um, it's been very stable for at least the last four years, um, which means FreeNAS gets to inherit that. When you're looking at ZFS versions, the version number changes when a major feature is added. So the chart shows what feature it is. So the original ZFS version in FreeBSD was version 6. Um, right now, if you're using uh, FreeBSD, you're either using version 15 or version 28. And version 28 is on the next page. Uh, version uh, 15 is missing a couple of things that 28 provides. So the two things that most people are most interested in um, to see if they want to go from 15 to 28, uh, the first one is RAID Z3. So it's one of the types of RAIDs. When you're looking at ZFS RAID, the number after it tells you how many disks you can lose without losing data. So in a RAID Z3, you can lose three disks. Doesn't matter where those disks are, how they're actually cabled together, and you will not lose data. ZFS version 15 only supports up to RAID Z2, which means you can lose up to two disks. And again, it doesn't matter if they're on the same cable or if they're on a different array. You can still lose two disks. So that's one feature that you get in 28 that you don't get in 15. The second feature is something called deduplication. And typically, when people use that word, it sounds like it's the greatest thing that was ever invented uh, until you go to use it. So deduplication, what it does is um, basically uh, ZFS and how it does its thing. If you have duplicate data, it'll go through all of your data, figure out what's duplicate, and then create pointers to duplicate data. So it actually saves space. 
and once your data is deduplicated, you have much better performance. So if you have a lot of duplicate data, it can really increase your performance. So that's the good stuff about deduplication. The bad thing is, is while it's actually doing the deduplication, if you don't have enough RAM, it will bring the system to its knees or it will crash it solid. So deduplication is very intensive and it's RAM intensive. So don't do it on a system that doesn't have a lot of RAM because you will take that system down, no problem. Um, I think somewhere in the notes, uh, they um, recommend how much RAM. It's like five gigs of RAM for every terabyte of data that you're deduplicating. So you need a lot of RAM if you're gonna use deduplication. The nice thing about deduplication is it's considered to be a ZFS attribute. That means I can have a data set, give it an amount of space, put my duplicate data there, and that is the only place that it will deduplicate. So it's just another attribute. So are you starting to think, wow, ZFS sounds pretty cool? It is pretty cool. Once you start working with it, and you can see what you can do. Um, I have a list of definitions here. Um, just to basically give you an idea, so a pool is just basically you feed ZFS disks and that's what it uses for storage. You can create multiple pools, uh, so it depends on how you want to set things up. One of the things that you'll see is we have um, um, links throughout the document um, for the ZFS uh, best recommendations guide. And if you are setting up a system, especially if you're setting up a serious system, you want to read through the recommendations first to one, see what sort of disk should I be feeding it, how big should the disk be, what type of RAID Z should I be putting these in to get the best performance, and those will all be recommended. So when you're setting up your storage pools, you can take a quick skim through the storage pool recommendations and it'll give you an idea how much data is a good limit to have in a pool, and when should I start thinking about multiple pools. Data sets, once you have your pool, you get to decide how you divide up that pool. And it doesn't matter what the size of the disks are, you're thinking areas, basically configuration areas. You know, do I want to limit users to a certain quota? Do I want to have so much data that's compressed? and other areas of data that's not compressed? Do I want to have certain areas that will be deduplicated and other areas won't? So that's what you're thinking. So you're not limited to what a file system typically tells you your limits are. Um, Zvol, if you're using iSCSI, iSCSI basically exports what is considered to be a raw disk. So to the end user, they, get, they see something that they can put a file system on and use for data. And that's something that lives on top of ZFS. So you can, if you're using iSCSI, if you need a client that needs to think it has 100 gigs of raw space, you create a Zvol and you set that with size limit on it. And then you set up an iSCSI share where you share that Zvol. So this is an attribute of ZFS that makes it look like it's an unformatted disk, even though it's just an amount of space in your pool. Um, snapshots. Snapshots can be a very um, good part of your backup strategy. So when you take a snapshot, it's basically what the file system looks like at that point in time. So it's a snapshot. It's different than UFS snapshots. Has anyone ever made a UFS snapshot before? If you UFS snapshot a two gig um, file system, you get a two gig snapshot. So if you're sending that someplace else, it's great if you need to quickly back up a system or to recreate a system, just to have a snapshot, but they take up a lot of space. When you create a ZFS snapshot, it takes up zero space and it's just how ZFS does its thing. Snapshots, you can clone those snapshots and it will actually give you a writable copy of what the system looked like at that point in time. 
And as you start changing data, that's when it starts taking up space. Okay, so snapshots, you can take a snapshot every five minutes of a 100 gig system, and the only thing that's really taking up space is your changes. So snapshots are really cool. Um, and then that's what a clone is. So a clone is a writable copy. So the snapshot itself is read-only. So if you want to actually change the data, you create a clone. Uh, deduplication we already talked about. And yes, it was five gigs of RAM per terabyte of storage to be deduplicated. So make sure you only do this on systems that have sufficient RAM. Is that plan on changing? No, that's just how it does its thing. So. so it uses something called DDTs, the dedupe tables. So it's basically, as it's crawling through your information to see what is duplicate, it's deciding you know, what needs extra pointers and all this stuff is residing in RAM until it's finished and it changes all of its pointer information. The problem is the storage is going faster than uh, RAM is catching up. Yeah, which is why you carefully plan where you put your duplicate data and then make sure that's on a data set and it's just that area that's being deduplicated. Um, we have something called the ZIL, your ZFS intent log. Basically, all the magic that ZFS does is happening in that intent log. So that's where it's figuring out what's being written to disk, um, what uh, is du duplicate data, all that sort of stuff. So all the file system stuff happens in the ZIL. The ZIL resides in RAM. So one of the biggest complaints we get from users, well, if I'm using FreeNAS 8, you say I need so much RAM. You do if you're using ZFS. You don't use ZFS if you have a gig of RAM in the system. It's not gonna be big enough to hold your intent log. And you will find that system will just crawl. You wouldn't believe how slowly that system goes. Yes? What's the minimum RAM requirement per terabyte if you're not running on? This, so it doesn't matter on the dis, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, I'm terrible with numbers, so you might. Like six terabytes a minute, um, six gigs of RAM minimum. I think it is a gig per, terabyte. yeah, I think it's a gig per terabyte. Now the minimum recommendation, so ZFS has this thing called prefetching, and it needs four gigs of RAM to prefetch. Now that means if you have four gigs of RAM installed, it's not gonna prefetch because your OS resides in RAM and some other stuff resides in RAM. The, you really need four gigs of usable RAM, which means you're pretty well installing eight gigs to get that. So if you have less than eight gigs of RAM, um, you'll have to really think, do I wanna use CFS? And if I do, I know that I really should be thinking better hardware down the line because it's going to slow things down. So I build you up on all the cool things you could do. And then we get to the, the reality. Yes, you're going to need decent RAM. And the reason you need it is because of the ZIL. You also have something called uh, L2ARC. And this is an on-disk cache. And how you do L2ARC, if you have critical data, depends upon uh, your version of ZFS. So right now, FreeNAS is using ZFS version 15, and if you lose your L2 arc, you may have lost your data. So that means if it's critical data, you mirror your L2 arc. Um, when you get to version 28, it has a mirrored L2 arc built in, so that you don't have to, you know, to dedicate a device uh, to be a mirrored L2 arc. And the only thing that can happen is if you lose, say if you were to lose an L2 arc, you might lose the last eight seconds of, of writes. So that's with version 28. In the FreeNAS 8 series, once 8.2 is out the door, we're gonna immediately have an 8.3 to bump everybody up to ZFS version 28. We didn't want to do that plus the plug-in architecture in one release. We figured plug-ins was enough. 
So we were waiting for FreeBSD 8.3 to came out, uh, come out, and that came out in April. Um, then we get to Scrubs. So Scrub is one of the neat things built into ZFS. It's the reason why ZFS wants direct access to your hardware. It can actually do uh, similar to a, a, a memory scrub um, or a mem test. It'll go and see if you have bad sectors or bad data written to disk. Um, once the scrub happens, it'll let you know if you have bad areas, and uh, typically um, that's a clue that you're starting to have a problem with one of your disks, and you may want to think about a replacement. One, um, we'll show how to schedule scrubs. Scrubs aren't RAM intensive, uh, they're uh, I.O. intensive. So you should not be doing a scrub on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock when all your users are accessing their data. Do it uh, Sunday, you know, at 3 in the morning or whatever. Um, and the default is to schedule it for a Sunday. Um, when we get into what can I actually do with my disks, you can still go in and stripe, uh, uh, set up a stripe with your disks. Um, this will obviously be the fastest, um, but a stripe does not provide redundancy. You can set up mirrors, and on the next page, um, we have some links on how to decide um, what sort of performance redundancy am I looking for. And you can stripe mirrors, which makes them much quicker. Uh, it supports things like RAID 6, RAID 10, uh, RAID 20, all the different types of RAIDs that you can do when you start getting into striping things. But typically, people are looking more at the RAID Zs, so the RAID Zs are the ones that aren't subject to that uh, right hole. Um, and the number tells you how many disks you can lose. And with ZFS, it never matters where that disk is physically cabled. Um, so it's, there's no limitation. If I lose two and they're on the same array, I've lost my data. So it doesn't care where they are. And typically, if you have a lot of disks and you're trying to set things up, um, you're going to take a look to see, um, am I looking at read performance, write performance? What is it that I'm trying to get out of my disk? The other thing when you're setting up a RAID Z, if you have 40 disks, uh, don't create a RAID Z out of 40 disks, even though you could. Your performance is going to suck. So, uh, one of the general rules with setting up a RAID Z is you never give it more than 12, and the optimal number is between three and nine disks. So if you have more disks than that, so these are called your groups, you just stripe your groups, and that makes CFS happy. And they have recommendations about how many disks should be per group to get the best performance, depending upon your type of RAID Z. Okay. Uh, any questions before we leave the, the ZFS features, FreeNAS features overview? Okay, let's see what fun we can have with an installation. What time is our first break? Oh, we can stop right now. We've got another five minutes. Okay, maybe we'll do that then because you have to change the cartridge. Okay, so we'll take our, our break a couple minutes early. How long is the break? Uh, the next Okay. So the chart shows what feature it is. So the original ZFS version in FreeBSD was version 6. Um, right now, if you're using uh, FreeBSD, you're either using version 15 or version 28 and version 28 is on the next page. Uh, version uh, 15 is missing a couple of things that 28 provides. So the two things that most people are most interested in um, to see if they want to go from 15 to 28, uh, the first one is RAID Z3. So it's one of the types of RAIDs. When you're looking at ZFS RAID, the number after it tells you how many disks you can lose without losing data. 
So in a RAID Z3, you can lose three disks, doesn't matter where those disks are, how they're actually cabled together, and you will not lose data. ZFS version 15 only supports up to RAID Z2, which means you can lose up to two disks. And again, it doesn't matter if they're on the same cable or if they're on a different array. You can still lose two disks. So that's one feature that you get in 28 that you don't get in 15. The second feature is something called deduplication. And typically, when people use that word, it sounds like it's the greatest thing that was ever invented uh, until you go to use it. So deduplication, what it does is um, basically uh, ZFS and how it does its thing. If you have duplicate data, it'll go through all of your data, figure out what's duplicate, and then create pointers to duplicate data. So it actually saves space. And once your data is deduplicated, you have much better performance. So if you have a lot of duplicate data, it can really increase your performance. So that's the good stuff about deduplication. The bad thing is, is while it's actually doing the deduplication, if you don't have enough RAM, it will bring the system to its knees or it will crash it solid. So deduplication is very intensive and it's RAM intensive. So don't do it on a system that doesn't have a lot of RAM because you will take that system down, no problem. Um, I think somewhere in the notes, uh, they um, recommend how much RAM. It's like five gigs of RAM for every terabyte of data that you're deduplicating. So you need a lot of RAM if you're gonna use deduplication. The nice thing about deduplication is it's considered to be a ZFS attribute. That means I can have a data set give it an amount of space, put my duplicate data there, and that is the only place that it will deduplicate. So it's just another attribute. So are you starting to think, wow, ZFS sounds pretty cool. It is pretty cool once you start working with it and you can see what you can do. Um, I have a list of definitions here. Um, just to basically give you an idea. So a pool is just basically you feed ZFS disks and that's what it uses for storage. You can create multiple pools, uh, so it depends on how you want to set things up. One of the things that you'll see is we have um, um, links throughout the document um, for the ZFS uh, best recommendations guide. And if you are setting up a system, especially if you're setting up a serious system, you want to read through the recommendations first to one, see what sort of disk should I be feeding it, how big should the disk be, what type of RAID Z should I be putting these in to get the best performance, and those will all be recommended. So when you're setting up your storage pools, you can take a quick skim through the storage pool recommendations and it'll give you an idea how much data is a good limit to have in a pool and when should I start thinking about multiple pools. Data sets, once you have your pool, you get to decide how you divide up that pool. And it doesn't matter what the size of the disks are, you're thinking areas, basically configuration areas. You know, do I want to limit users to a certain quota? Do I want to have so much data that's compressed? and other areas of data that's not compressed? Do I want to have certain areas that will be deduplicated and other areas won't? So that's what you're thinking. So you're not limited to what a file system typically tells you your limits are. Um, Zvol, if you're using iSCSI, iSCSI basically exports what is considered to be a raw disk. So to the end user, they, get, they see something that they can put a file system on and use for data. And that's something that lives on top of ZFS. So you can, if you're using iSCSI, if you need a client that needs to think it has 100 gigs of raw space, you create a ZVOL and you set that with size limit on it. And then you set up an iSCSI share where you share that ZVOL. So this is an attribute of ZFS that makes it look like it's an unformatted disk, even though it's just an amount of space in your pool. 
Um, snapshots. Snapshots can be a very um, good part of your backup strategy. So when you take a snapshot, it's basically what the file system looks like at that point in time. So it's a snapshot. It's different than UFS snapshots. Has anyone ever made a UFS snapshot before? If you UFS snapshot a two gig um, file system, you get a two gig snapshot. So if you're sending that someplace else, it's great if you need to quickly back up a system or to recreate a system, just to have a snapshot, but they take up a lot of space. When you create a ZFS snapshot, it takes up zero space. And it's just how ZFS does its thing. Snapshots, you can clone those snapshots and it will actually give you a writable copy of what the system looked like at that point in time. And as you start changing data, that's when it starts taking up space. Okay, so snapshots, you can take a snapshot every five minutes of a 100 gig system, and the only thing that's really taking up space is your changes. So snapshots are really cool. Um, and then that's what a clone is. So a clone is a writable copy. So the snapshot itself is read-only. So if you want to actually change the data, you create a clone. Uh, deduplication we already talked about. And yes, it was five gigs of RAM per terabyte of storage to be deduplicated. So make sure you only do this on systems that have sufficient RAM. Is that fine? No, that's just how it does its thing. So. so it uses something called DDTs, the dedupe tables. So it's basically, as it's crawling through your information to see what is duplicate, it's deciding you know, what needs extra pointers and all this stuff is residing in RAM until it's finished and it changes all of its pointer information. The problem is the storage is going faster than uh, RAM is. Yeah, which is why you carefully plan where you put your duplicate data and then make sure that's on a data set and it's just that area that's being deduplicated. Um, we have something called the ZIL, your ZFS intent log. Basically, all the magic that ZFS does is happening in that intent log. So that's where it's figuring out what's being written to disk, um, what uh, is du duplicate data, all that sort of stuff. So all the file system stuff happens in the ZIL. The ZIL resides in RAM. So one of the biggest complaints we get from users, well, if I'm using FreeNAS 8, you say I need so much RAM. You do if you're using ZFS. You don't use ZFS if you have a gig of RAM in the system. It's not going to be big enough to hold your intent log. And you will find that system will just crawl. You wouldn't believe how slowly that system goes. Yes? What's the minimum RAM requirement per terabyte if you're not running on duplication? This, so it doesn't matter on the disk. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I'm terrible with numbers. So you yeah, might. Like six terabytes minimum, um, six gigs of RAM minimum. Yeah. I think it is a gig per, yeah, I think it's a gig per terabyte. Now, the minimum recommendation, so ZFS has this thing called prefetching, and it needs four gigs of RAM to prefetch. Now, that means if you have four gigs of RAM installed, it's not going to prefetch, because your OS resides in RAM, and some other stuff resides in RAM. The, you really need four gigs of usable RAM, which means you're pretty well installing eight gigs to get that. So if you have less than eight gigs of RAM, um, you'll have to really think, do I want to use CFS? And if I do, I know that I really should be thinking better hardware down the line, because it's going to slow things down. So I build you up on all the cool things you could do. And then we get to the, the reality. Yes, you're going to need decent RAM. And the reason you need it is because of the ZIL. You also have something called uh, L2ARC. And this is an on-disk cache. And how you do L2ARC, if you have critical data, depends upon uh, your version of ZFS. 
So right now, FreeNAS is using ZFS version 15. And if you lose your L2 arc, you may have lost your data. So that means if it's critical data, you mirror your L2 arc. Um, when you get to version 28, it has a mirrored L2 arc built in so that you don't have to, you know, dedicate a device uh, to be a mirrored L2 arc. And the only thing that can happen is if you lose, say if you were to lose an L2 arc, you might lose the last eight seconds of, of writes. So that's with version 28. In the FreeNAS 8 series, once 8.2 is out the door, we're going to immediately have an 8.3 to bump everybody up to ZFS version 28. We didn't want to do that plus the plug-in architecture in one release. We figured plugins was enough. <laughs> so we were waiting for FreeBSD 8.3 to came out, uh, come out, and that came out in April. Um, then we get to Scrubs. So Scrub is one of the neat things built into ZFS. It's the reason why ZFS wants direct access to your hardware. It can actually do uh, similar to a, a, a memory scrub um, or a mem test. It'll go and see if you have bad sectors or bad data written to disk. Um, once the scrub happens, it'll let you know if you have bad areas, and uh, typically um, that's a clue that you're starting to have a problem with one of your disks, and you may want to think about a replacement. One, um, we'll show how to schedule scrubs. Scrubs aren't RAM intensive, uh, they're uh, I.O. intensive. So you should not be doing a scrub on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock when all your users are accessing their data. Do it uh, Sunday, you know, at 3 in the morning or whatever. Um, and the default is to schedule it for a Sunday. Um, when we get into what can I actually do with my disks, you can still go in and stripe, uh, uh, set up a stripe with your disks. Um, this will obviously be the fastest, um, but a stripe does not provide redundancy. You can set up mirrors, and on the next page, um, we have some links on how to decide um, what sort of performance redundancy am I looking for. And you can stripe mirrors, which makes them much quicker. Uh, it supports things like RAID 6, RAID 10, uh, RAID 20, all the different types of RAIDs that you can do when you start getting into striping things. But typically, people are looking more at the RAID Zs, so the RAID Zs are the ones that aren't subject to that uh, right hole. Um, and the number tells you how many disks you can lose. And with ZFS, it never matters where that disk is physically cabled. Um, so it's, there's no limitation. If I lose two and they're on the same array, I've lost my data. So it doesn't care where they are. And typically, if you have a lot of disks and you're trying to set things up, um, you're going to take a look to see, um, am I looking at read performance, write performance? What is it that I'm trying to get out of my disks? The other thing when you're setting up a RAID Z, if you have 40 disks, uh, don't create a RAID Z out of 40 disks, even though you could. Your performance is going to suck. So, uh, one of the general rules with setting up a RAID Z is you never give it more than 12, and the optimal number is between 3 and 9 disks. So if you have more disks than that, so these are called your groups, you just stripe your groups, and that makes CFS happy. And they have recommendations about how many disks should be per group to get the best performance, depending upon your type of RAID Z. Okay. Uh, any questions before we leave the, the ZFS features, FreeNAS features overview? Okay, let's see what fun we can have with an installation. What time is our first break? Oh, we can stop right now. We've got another five minutes. Okay, maybe we'll do that then, because you have to change the cartridge. Okay, so we'll take our, our break a couple minutes early. How long is the break? Uh, the next Okay.
Okay. Uh, so we're going to see what luck we have with an installation. Um, some of the features that are new in 8.2 uh, that are coming up and that will be in your uh, testing version. Um, obviously the plug-in API, the architecture uh, that we'll be looking at later this afternoon. Uh, there will be software available uh, to do BitTorrent, uh, UPnP, and iTunes. And from the command line, uh, there already is built-in DLNA and torrent support. One of the things, once we start going through the configuration workflow, uh, one of the big things I'll tell you is when you're configuring FreeNAS, always use the GUI. Don't, if you're a command line person, don't SSH in and start changing things. You can use web shell now if you're a command line person, but you basically want to be in through your web browser when you're configuring FreeNAS. Because the reason for that, it's how the configuration database is tied into the system. If you're doing it from an SSH session um, from your client, you're not tied into that configuration database. Having said that, one of the new features uh, in 8.2 is if you are already a ZFS guru and you're used to doing your ZFS and zpool commands at the command line, you can now do that and it will be tied into the configuration database. Um, if you're using uh, multipath capable hardware, it will automatically detect that and show you what your multipath configuration is. You don't have to do anything, it just sort of does it for you. Uh, we have the web shell is new. Something else that's new and has been useful to people with limited hardware is there is now an auto-tuning script that will, if you run it, it will detect what hardware you're running and it will set um, sysctl settings uh, to tune it for that hardware. So if you're a bit low on RAM, um, uh, those sort of things. Um, the uh, docs at the freenas.org uh, website describe where to find that auto-tuning script and you can actually look at it to see what it's doing and what it's setting. One of the problems with previous versions of FreeNAS is the iSCSI um, uh, target software that we use had a limitation in that it didn't um, accept hop signals which meant basically if you changed your configuration, it had to restart the daemon. In theory, the iSCSI initiator um, software on the client should have had a timeout period that it wouldn't notice, but a lot of clients did notice. So one of the big changes in 8.2 is you no longer have to restart the daemon when you make changes. Uh, there is a specific way you have to set up your configuration though. Um, I'll leave this in the PDF for you, just the, the hardware considerations. So typically the hardware depends upon if you're using ZFS or not. So if you're going to be using ZFS, you're going to be installing on better hardware. FreeNAS supports both 32 and 64-bit systems. If you're using a 32-bit box, you're going to be limited in your RAM uh, just by the design, by the architecture. Uh, general rule with FreeNAS, if you're using ZFS, uh, stick in as much RAM as your hardware will let you put in there. You are going to need either a compact flash or a USB flash device because it's not designed to install the OS on a hard drive. It doesn't mean it won't let you do it, but if you do, you've lost the use of that hard drive. So this is a 2 gig operating system. If you install it on a 100 gig drive, um, you've just used up that whole drive to install two gigs worth of data on it. So don't install it on a hard drive. Um, we got the hardware list if you're looking at uh, disks and controllers. What else do we got here? Network interfaces. We found that Realtek really sucks. So if you want good performance, uh, don't use an onboard Realtek. You know, you're just not going to get network performance out of it. If you're buying a network interface and you want good performance, we recommend Intel 
or a Chelsea. Uh, both of them we've had very good luck with. In the real world, if you're downloading FreeNAS, if you go to the SourceForge website and there's a link there, there will be three different files that are available. The one that says upgrade, you obviously only download when you're doing an upgrade, and we'll talk a bit about upgrades. So you basically have a choice between an ISO file or an IMG file, an image. And typically, it's not what we're doing in the lab today, um, but typically you download the IMG file, you use some sort of DD command, and you write it directly to your USB device. You, if it's a thumb drive, you plug it in and away you go. Because we're working in VirtualBox and you have to go through hoops uh, to use IMG files in VirtualBox, we'll be using the ISO, which is another method that people can do. So I um, see that most of you already seem to be quite familiar with VirtualBox, but you never know if people have used VirtualBox before or not. So you can watch me as I set up my system. I recommend that if you want to um, use VirtualBox and access your FreeNAS system through your web browser, that you disable your wireless card um, because that will probably mess up your connection. And I've had good luck of statically adding an IP address to my Ethernet card, even though it's not plugged in, but that may be operating system specific. So I'm gonna start, and we'll see what luck we have today, because always when you're doing things live, something doesn't work. So I'm just gonna give a static address to my Ethernet card, and it helps to be root. and then set up a VirtualBox setting. So if you've never set up VirtualBox before, or just want a refresher, you can follow along. So uh, when you're selecting the operating system type, uh, select BSD, because it is based on FreeBSD. The amount of memory is going to depend upon what you have on your system. Um, if you have enough RAM, uh, to put in at least 4096. If not, put in what you can. And then we're going to make our VirtualBox disk images. When you're installing FreeNAS in VirtualBox, you're going to want to make at least two uh, disk images. So one is going to hold your operating system and then you're gonna to have to create additional virtual disks to hold the actual storage so that you have something that's gonna show up in your volume manager. Um, real world, when you're installing FreeNAS, it takes up two gigs of space. If you're using a USB thumb drive, we recommend at least four gigs because a lot of um, two gig drives, especially the cheaper ones, don't give you two gigs worth of space and they'll give you like 1.86, it'll install and then it won't boot. So uh, just buy yourself a four gig drive and uh, go from there. So I usually set mine at four, just cause I never know what's gonna happen. So I am just created my first virtual disk and that will hold uh, the operating system. Once I've done that, I can go into storage and create additional disks and I'll be doing these for storage. And if you're using ZFS, and all of these are on, if I'm going too fast for you, these are all on the PDF as well. There was a size limit for ZFS. Your storage devices um, cannot be less than four gigs if you're using ZFS, just how ZFS does swap. And real world, if you're working with really small disks, you're gonna find that a lot of your disk space is being used for swap. 
So if you're playing in VirtualBox just to test it out, I recommend that you do at least a six gig disk size. And again, it depends how much disk space you have to play with. So I'm gonna make two uh, 10 gig sizes. Actually, I might make three, just so we can see more stuff in Volume Manager. So there's my first one. Now I'll create a second one. So these are gonna be for storage. I'm gonna add another controller so I can add more disks. So I'm up to my third disk now. And for the fun of it, I'll add a fourth disk. Reason why I'm adding a lot of disks is we're gonna find out when we go to create our volumes, what you can create depends upon how many disks you have to feed it. So whether you're gonna get a stripe or RAID Z1, RAID Z2. So I'm gonna, so I'm up to four disks now. The other thing I need to do is I need to tell it where the ISO is. If you're installing, let's see what we got here. You may find it quicker to run the ISO from disk. It's quicker than doing it from the CD, but you can also select to use your CD drive. Um, if you have it, the CD inserted. But I'm gonna, I have it on my hard drive, so I'm gonna do it from the hard drive. So I've created a four gig disk to hold the OS, and I have four 10 gig disks to be used for storage. The other thing that I need to do, um, at least in this version of VirtualBox, the default is to use NAT. You won't be able to use networking unless you changed it to bridged adapter. And you'll want it to point to the interface. So in this case, it's the one I put the static IP on. And I'm just gonna turn off audio because you don't really need audio. Okay. So we're gonna start this machine. So it's a very, anybody who's ever installed FreeBSD before, uh, you, if you're used to the old sysinstall menu, it looks sort of like it. You use your up and down arrow keys to access things. FreeNAS, if there is already a FreeNAS system uh, installed, it will recognize that and it will ask you if you want to upgrade. So you can upgrade from CD. This is a fresh virtual machine, so we, uh, it'll only install and it will show you what your disks are. So what you wanna do is point to the disk that represents your USB thumb drive, the one that you're gonna put the operating system on. So that was the one that I made as a four gig. It gives you a warning that basically whatever device you've chosen, you're gonna lose that device because it's just gonna be available for the operating system and it's gonna remind you this shouldn't be a hard drive if this is on real hardware. So we'll proceed with the installation. Basically, the installation takes that image .xz file that you could have downloaded, and it DDs it for you. So if you're really terrible at using DD, and you don't want to try to figure out how to use it, you can use a CD, and it will do it for you. That's basically what it's doing. Uh, if anybody came in late, um, all the course materials are on the USB thumb drives and uh, the ISO is also on the CD. So you'll see it's a very quick install. It's just basically DDing an image uh, to the device. I reboot the system and I catch virtual box as it goes by so it doesn't start the installer again. So I'm gonna go into the primary master. The F1, F2 screen 
If you ever uh, uh, install FreeNAS and for whatever reason it can't boot, uh, just go back to that screen and pick the, uh, the opposite one and it will pick the installation that was there before. So if you ever have a failed upgrade, that's how you do that. So it's going to do its thing. It's going to take a while because it's not going to find a DHCP server um, because I don't have anything plugged in. Uh, once it's booted up, I'll assign it an IP address. And if all goes well, um, we'll be able to get in through the web browser. So it's just going to look for a DHCP server for a while. Now, I went through that very quickly. Um, did anybody have any questions? Did I miss you on how to set up VirtualBox? Uh, people that came in, um, if you have a laptop, you're welcome to sit at the table and plug in and play along. Okay. And in, in the PDF, we do have all of those screens. So if I did go by too quickly, uh, you can review those yourself. Real world, if you're plugged into the network, it grabs an IP address, and it will tell you what IP address you can use in your browser to access your installation. Okay, we're getting someplace. Okay, so right now it's saying you can use the following URL to access it, 0000, which isn't going to get me any place. It's because we didn't have a DHCP server. This is known as the FreeNAS console. So if you do have physical access to the system that's plugged into a monitor and a keyboard, uh, you can get into the system that way. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to statically configure a network address. So it uh, tells you to enter an option from 1 to 11 if you want to access the console. So we're already there, so we're going to configure an interface. It will display a list of all of the interfaces that it recognizes. So it's recognizing my Ethernet interface, which is option 1, so I type 1. And I don't want to reset the network configuration, so I'll just say no. And I don't want to go for DHCP, because I don't have a server. But I do want to configure IP version 4, so I'll say yes. You can press enter at the interface name, because that's just a description. So when I manually set the IP address on my host system, I gave it 10.0.0.0.1. So I'm going to give this guy 10.0.0.2. And I'm going to give it a slash 24. Uh, actually, I better give it a slash 8. I don't want to do IP version 6. And it says try 10.0.0.2 in the web. So we'll see what luck we have. Now, if you're setting up your own, um, don't give it the same IP. Um, so if you've statically set yourself an address, uh, just give it uh, another address in that range. So let's see if we can get in. Yeah, it's taking a while.
And of course, this always works from home and doesn't work when you're doing it in front of people. Let's see what we got here. Oh, it's not. I'm going to drop to a shell. Just make sure I don't have something mold in my um, Should be fine. So this will be a much more exciting demonstration uh, if we can't get it to. I don't know why it's doing that. I changed to bridge network, so that's fine. 5.0.0.0.0. I'm ping myself. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Now I practiced this the other day. Yeah, I hate doing it through wireless though because it's so. What IP addresses are you using? What is. that you have to change. I don't know if they showed it in that. Go, where's your virtual box? Yeah, up there. Yeah, change it to bridge. Did you yeah, do Yeah, I changed bridge? it to bridge, yeah. And then it ha came up with an ethernet or something? Yeah, Okay. so that's fine. Anybody know what um, network range the wireless network is on? So we're not interfering with that. Yeah, I'm going to try it wirelessly. We'll do that. So we're self-public? see what happens here. So I'm going to reboot this guy. Yeah, so I'm bridged EM0. EM0. Okay, and we'll see what luck we have.
missed it. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, let's see if it picks up the DHCP server. No, it's not picking up wireless. I don't think that's going to work. Sorry? No, it has an address, my WLAN 0, but it's not. But it's not, it's not picking up the WLAN 0, that's the problem. I'll try giving it an address. No, but then it would still be EM0. So I changed it to WLAN 0 instead of EM 0? No, there's only one, one interface in, in the FreeNAS virtual machine because um, VirtualBox only presents one interface. And so VirtualBox is the one that does the bridging. So you shouldn't change anything within FreeNAS. Just change it back to a DHCP address because you, you statically assigned it at 10. Right. Yeah, it's probably the network going up and down. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't pick up the um, EM0. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you down. I'm gonna try this one more time. Is anybody able to be up on the internet? Yeah. Okay. If you need to, you can just connect to mine. Yeah, well, we may have to. I'll give her one more go, and if that doesn't work, we'll change systems.
Sorry? Is there anything we can do to help you out? No. Okay. You got it under control? Mm hmm Oh. What's that? What did you do before you rebooted? You just reset the network? Yeah, I went. I disabled my wireless. And went back to um, my Ethernet. Yes. So yours is still connected? Yeah. Knock on wood? Okay, well, let's try yours then. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's an idea. Okay, let me get mine back up then. Okay, so what's the address? Okay, so normally the first time you access your FreeNAS system, you do not get prompted for a username and password. It just lets you in. So one of the first things, do you want to come in and you can just come in and log in. Sorry, Pierce hasn't been set yet. What's your IP? 131. Everybody's... <laughs> Now that is what you want your FreeNAS system to look like though, because that's the first thing you do is you go in and you set it. So the first time you access FreeNAS, uh, you'll see a screen similar to this, and you'll also get this nice big flashing red alert there. That's our alert system. And there is a critical message saying that you have to change the password for the admin user. So the, originally, um, the original design in FreeNAS 8 was there was a preset username and password for you. And because that's a known value and people tend not to remember to change passwords, it was considered to be more secure to not set defaults and to give you that red flashing message saying, go ahead and do this. So it is the first thing you should do. Uh, otherwise, anybody who knows the IP address of the FreeNAS system and can get to it, can go in and do anything to your FreeNAS system. So the first thing you do is you go to the account and the admin account. Now in FreeNAS, the admin account is a special built account that doesn't work with anything but the web GUI. So you can't use this account to SSH into the box. It doesn't exist, it doesn't show up uh, when you look at your users, you won't see this account. So it's only used for the web GUI. If I click change admin user, it's gonna tell me that the default username is admin 
and because that is a known value, it's well documented, you should change that. So you'll give this a different value. These two fields are optional. So it's up to you if you want to put in a first name and a last name. So you give this a different value, you click Change Admin User. That's just the first step, though. You'll then want to go in and set a password for that user account. As soon as you set those two options, the alert will change from the flashing red to a solid green, uh, indicating that's no longer something that requires administrative attention. And if you go and log out, you'll see that login menu that we saw before. When you're setting the password, you'll notice there's a box here called change root password as well. Because the admin account is not the same as the root account, it's up to you whether you want to A, have a password on the root account. By default, there isn't one. And if you leave that default, it means root can't get into the system. So if root tries to SSH in or whatever, it's just gonna keep giving error messages because there's no password set on that account. So the default is to set both to the same value. Uh, personally, I think that's a terrible default. I always uncheck that box and um, I don't log in as root, uh, simple as that. Now in the FreeBSD world, um, typically, um, if you're dealing with things like SSH, root logins are disabled by default, and that's the same on FreeNAS. And even if you go in and find a box to turn on root logins, um, the password is not set by default, meaning that it will fail. Um, so we discourage people, don't turn on root logins and don't set the root password. The only time you set the root password is if you do have an administrator who does SSH into the box. What you want to do is give that user SU access. You want them to have the ability to switch to the root user account um, when they need to do something administrative. So that's sort of the FreeBSD way of doing things. To do that, when you create a user, and a lot of people get confused by these screens. So they're well documented in the documentation, but nobody reads the documentation until something doesn't work. So there are, there are rare people out there that read everything first so then go in and do things, but that's not how people work. So a lot of people, if you're a FreeBSD person, you know that you have to be a big wheel to become a super user. So you live in the wheel group. If I'm creating a user who I plan to be able to SSH in and SU to root, I do not pick wheel out of the primary group. So you'll notice by default this drop down is blocked. The default in FreeBSD when you create a new user is a group of the same name is created as well. That's called their primary group. And typically that's fine, that's what you want to do. If I specify a primary group thinking, well, I want to put them in wheel, that will not do what you want it to do. That's going to fail. One of the built-in security measures for FreeBSD is if a user's primary group is wheel, they are um, banned from doing SU because typically it's thinking that some sort of script has gone in and made a user account for that purpose. So the default should be leave them to make their own um, username, the same as the group name. What you want to do go down here is the auxiliary groups are the extra groups that you live in. This is where you put the user into wheel. And now that user, if they, S, if they SSH in, has permissions to SU. So that's where you give that permission. This is not the full thing though, because when you SU to become a super user, it prompts you for the root password. And if you have not set the root password, they're not gonna be able to authenticate. So going back to this screen, if you want these two to be different passwords, which is a good idea, go to view users and um, change the password for root. 
By default, there is no password, so you're really setting it for the first time. So that's what you want to do if you have users um, SSH again that need to S you. So that's the first thing you do um, when you get into a free NAS system. So that's in the uh, PDF is step number one. The second thing you want to do is you want to set the administrative email address. So FreeNAS has been set up, uh, again, if you're used to administering FreeBSD systems, you know that there are daily, weekly, and monthly emails that get sent to root, and they do things like security checks and tell you your disk status and how much disk space is being used, that sort of stuff. So this is emails that the root user should be reading every day. The other thing that FreeNAS adds to that is the whole alert system. So the alert system is really handy if you happen to have your browser up and you're looking and you notice something red flashing. But if you've set up the system and then you forget about it for six months, you want to know if a new alert has been issued. Because typically it's going to tell you something like one of your smart tests indicates that you have a pending disk failure. Or um, let's see. Uh, a ZFS scrub has found errors and wants to tell you about that. So you do want to be receiving that information. That information is automatically sent to the root user, but nobody's going to see it if you don't set an email address for the root user. So give that the administrative email address so that you're getting those emails uh, as they're generated. So that's the second thing you do on your FreeNAS system. Next thing you want to do, especially when you're configuring the system for the first time and you start um, turning on services and maybe there's a problem and the service doesn't start, you're going to know right away that's um, what's happening. And the reason for that, if you turn on something called console logging. So in the system, um, you're going to want to check out your settings. There are some interesting settings in here. And in the advanced field, you have something called show console messages in the footer. And that's off by default, but if you turn that on and press save, you basically get the output of uh, tail minus F var log messages. So your var log messages are going to scroll by. So if you're starting services and a service doesn't start, you're going to have a bird's eye view. Uh, it's not starting because it found a typo in this config file, because that will show in the messages. So it's very handy to have on before you start doing configurations. So that's typically the third thing I do on a new FreeNAS system. Once you've set your administrative username and password, uh, you've set your email address, so you know you're going to get emails, and you have console logging, you're ready to start playing with the system. So while we have it um, here, we'll just do a quick overview. So um, you'll notice FreeNAS is divided into areas. So we have our tree menu here. Um, for those of you who actually do read documentation, the documentation is set up to follow the flow of the tree menu. So if you're um, going through system and you want to know, you know, what can I do in system settings, you'll find that in that section of the documentation. So the documentation itself um, covers every screen in the FreeNAS interface, what all the options mean, and what sort of values you can put in there. So it is good to refer to, uh, especially if you're configuring something for the first time. It's something you haven't used before. So we have a tree menu, which you can uh, expand all and collapse all. You'll notice as you start opening screens, Tabs will be added here, and if you start opening a lot of screens, you'll get a lot of tabs. Um, so you can um, um, close tabs as you need to. For those people who don't think tree-wise, you can also use the buttons up here, 
and it will show you the same things, but they're just laid out a bit differently. Um, to give you an idea of the things you can do, so if we take a look at account, and a lot of these will, we're just sort of um, giving an overview before we get into the configuration workflow. Um, a lot of these give you an idea of, of where you go in the tree to do things. So if you um, need to create users and groups, you do so in the account section. And that's if you're manually creating users. The system contains settings um, that basically apply to the whole system. So we won't be showing how to do cron jobs today, so I'll just do a quick overview so you can see what that screen looks like. If I want to add a cron job, I basically get to select when it happens and I don't have to play with those asterisks in that config file. Now, it's the same as setting up any cron job. So you can either uh, set it up on a per user basis, so you can make a user cron job or you can make a system cron job. You got five minutes, okay. Whenever you are um, creating cron jobs, you always refer to a command and you always give the full path name. And anybody who's created cron jobs before know it doesn't work the way you intended if you don't give the full path name. And you always test whatever command or script that you're croning before you cron it to make sure it actually does what you want it to do. You can give it a short description. Then you can select your minutes, hours, the day of the month, the month, the day of the week. The other thing you can do with cron jobs, especially if you're testing them, if you've already made a cron job but you don't want it to run, uh, just uncheck the enabled box. It won't delete the job, it just won't run it. And then when you're ready again, you can turn it back on. Any cron jobs you create will show up under view cron jobs. And you can have as many cron jobs as you want. NTP servers, NTP is a big deal if you're in an Active Directory or an LDAP network because we're dealing with time sensitive applications. By default, your FreeNAS system is already set up to use uh, the FreeBSD NTP servers. You can go in and view those settings or edit them, or you can go in and add your own NTP servers. It's important if um, uh, AD or uh, LDAP is on your system that the domain controllers are using the same NTP servers as your FreeNAS system. So if you have your own servers, you're going to want to go in and change those. Reporting is something that's going to look different in the RC and the release, we're actually redoing the whole reporting mechanism because people wanted to be able to support plugins. So we're using RRD, but we're only using a subset of graphs. So they're making the uh, GUI more um, modular so you can plug in the RRD graphs that you want to see. Uh, by default, it's going to show your system load, your processes, your network interface traffic on a network interface basis your uh, disk usage on a disk basis. So it does show a fair bit of graphs. Two minutes. RSync, we're gonna show you how to create an RSync task. The smart tests, uh, we, are, uh, we do support smart. So if your disk supports smart, you can say what sort of test you wanna do and you ha do have to understand what the tests do, because some tests actually um, disable the disk while the test is running, and some will put a lot of load on a disk. So you do want to understand what the tests do, and we have um, links to what the tests do in the documentation. But then you can also go and say when you want the test to run. And I think I'll leave sysctls and tunables for after the break. So how long is the next break for? Is it for 15? OK. So we'll uh, continue uh, the uh, overview of the screens when we come back from break.
cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. 
The gym has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.